Where is this at, Nadia? Shanghai. We made it to People's Square Station, and it's honestly the most annoying station in Shanghai. <laughs> So because the buses aren't running, all the tourists are having to walk all the way down the mountain. Neha. Neha ma. I'm finally back in Qinghai. My parents in law came home. <laughs> Okay, made it to Wudang Shan, but it's bloody freezing. A taste of what's to come. I am currently sitting in my new room, in my new apartment here in Shanghai. So that means that I moved back to China. My name is Miriam. I come from Sweden and I live in Qinghai in Western China. So my name is George Thompson and I'm from Bristol in the United Kingdom. And I came out to China four months ago. I'm currently training in a Tai Chi school. My name is Kaya and I'm originally from Poland. I live in Shanghai now. I'm doing MBA in luxury brand management. <laughs> So I live in a relatively small village, but it doesn't feel very small because all the houses are what is it, gathered in the middle and then the field is surrounding the village. So you don't have your uh, fields just next to the house as you would have in like Sweden. It's, it's a good community feeling, I think. We're on our way to grandma's house now and it will take us probably about 40 minutes to get there. We arrived at Grandma's house and did picking some vegetables. So we'll use these to make dumplings tonight. I guess I was curious about China, but I didn't really know anything about China until I came here, and I came here in 2015 as an exchange student. When I got here, I just got really fascinated by everything. Like it exceeded all of my expectations. You can't really explore all of China in half a year. It's so much, it's so big, and the cultures within China are so different, and the nature and everything varies very much between like the west and the east and the north and the south and um, so I guess I didn't feel like I was finished and that's why I stayed. It's freaking snowing. My preconceptions of China were a polluted police state. <laughs> Shifu's taking me to a mysterious cave. That's why I have this 
uh, musical instrument because additionally they can be used <laughs> as a walking stick. Be careful here, this point. <laughs> okay, good. Ah, congratulations. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So in China, there's the distinction between Shaolin Kung Fu and Wudang Kung Fu. And Shaolin is the more famous of the two. You see them doing crazy flips and it's a lot more about the martial art aspect. Whereas Wudang is more about internal. So it's the birthplace of Tai Chi, as I mentioned. And I thought, well, I'm actually more interested in the sort of meditation and internal development as well as the sort of physical side. So I thought, hey, I'll come out to Wudang. What I ended up doing was just asking the locals if there were any Kung Fu schools around. And uh, one of the locals took me to a school, which is the one that I'm at here. And it turned out to be a Tai Chi school. But the great thing about this place is that the master speaks English. And so it, the stars were aligned that day because um, that since turning it up here literally by chance, having not planned anything and not even intending to do Tai Chi, but I kind of stumbled across Master Gu's place and have since fell in love with Tai Chi. But the whole area of the Wudang Mountains itself has since been restricted to only tourists. Uh, well, it's, it's a you can't make a building here without um, permission. So it's a very strict kind of rural and tranquil area. We have a house there, a house next to us, and then that's it for the kind of ne next mile or two radius. So it's very, very quiet and very, very peaceful. So I came to China the very first time um, four years ago, uh, right after graduating high school. And I came to China to stay here for one year to study Chinese at Fudan University in Shanghai. So in the beginning, it was really hard. It was almost like a little weird thing to do to just randomly go to China at this age. It was like my first time moving out of my house and like I moved out to China, you know, but like really quickly it became like the best Thing ever and this year that I spent in China I always said that was like the best year of my life like since I left I always wanted to come back three years later I am back and I am so freaking excited I would never consider any other cities in China to be honest I would not want to live in any other city than Shanghai I think it all depends what you're into you know and I do love China I am really interested in their culture I study Chinese and all that but I think living in the rural areas or in the smaller cities is just too much I still want to have you know the comfort of Western food and like be able to talk to foreigners like I still want I want to have the mix of both lives. Two of my roommates have actually never been to the bound. They've never seen Nanjing Road, which are like the main attractions of Shanghai. You can transfer to line one. We am wearing sunglasses on the side to take them out. We made it to People's Square Station and it's honestly the most annoying station in Shanghai. It has 20 exits like imagine how freaking big it is it has like multiple levels and 20 freaking exits and it's super confusing if i would ever live downtown i would definitely not want to live by people's square station like we've been in the station for like five minutes already and we're still not out so this is why it was a very bad idea to come to nanjing road on a sunday it's literally packed with people People are just literally walking on the street because there is no... Okay, now the sidewalk's kind of empty, but you know what I'm trying to say. There is a lot of people. How can you not love this city? Shanghai. <laughs> Why is it special? Because it's special because we are 
So I met my husband in Shanghai. He was here in the market selling goji berries. And then I had two other friends, two Chinese friends who sell honey. So they were also at the event. So I came to visit them. And then I saw my husband there. <laughs> and we, this was when I just started to like seriously study Mandarin. So I couldn't really speak anything at all. So we only, like we texted on WeChat, just translated everything on WeChat. And that was in the same time that I really started to like China and explore China more. Yeah, I met him and then I went to visit his village. And I don't know, I just really liked it. <laughs> yeah, and I liked him. So normally people here, they are introduced to each other. I guess the parents have a talk first and then they think oh, our daughter and your son, they would suit each other. <laughs> so most of the couples that marry have known each other for only two or three months. Now, when divorce is becoming more and more common in China, there are a lot of couples that are married for like a year and then they just get a divorce because they don't like each other at all. <laughs> yeah, it's changing, I think. And my husband is, I guess, a proof of that because he refused to meet any of those girls that his parents wanted to introduce. He was like, no, I'm going to fall in love by myself, so I don't need your help. So the general rule is that the woman move, moves in with the husband's family and um, then they live with their in-laws until, you know, forever, <laughs> until they pass away, basically. I think you live more as a family, so they live with their in-laws and they look after their in-laws um, and then the in-laws help them look after the children. I think if I was a Chinese person, they would, would require me to do maybe more housework and cooking and things. But the thing is, I really like cooking, so I'm learning a lot. So I do cook a lot. Um, so I guess I've taken kind of the typical housewife role almost. The first time I came, they were really, really, really welcoming. And when I left that time, my mother-in-law actually cried. Yeah, she's really, really nice. But I think that she was crying was probably also a little bit her worrying that I wouldn't come back. Like, I think they were worried about me not being able to adapt to this kind of life. Because even though they've never been to, they've never been abroad, they haven't really been to any big cities, they've only been in this province, they've never traveled. Um, I still, like, they still understand that life in my country is very different from here. It is very basic in many ways so it's not all the things you're used to at home like you know washing your hair is a very long process or um, when you have to you can't shower all the time because you have to wait for the water to get hot it get it's um it warms up by the sun the thing is we don't really have heating in the house right so we're sleeping the beds are fine me and Hong have an electric blanket and my parents-in-law have a kang which is a Chinese, like a northern Chinese type of bed made of bricks and then you put a fire underneath it to keep it warm. <coughs> and this is for the Kang. So living on the mountain, it means that you divide the sort of food consumption between buying it from the town and the market down there and then also growing your own. So we have quite a large vegetable patch and there's an older gentleman who lives next to us and he kind of runs that. The water is fresh water from uh, the mountain. So it's just there's a stream and, and, and the community here taps into it. And it, because I've been here in the winter, it's got so cold that the whole stream is frozen as well as all the pipes. So in that case, we've had to revert to using a well. And so just I've been having to heave buckets up this well. So we've got one tap in the house that works and that's this tap here. So I'm having to fill up these basins and then put it in the washing machine. So in terms of drying the stuff, I've got these little infrared heaters in my bathroom because when you have a shower here, it's absolutely 
freezing otherwise. So yeah, you can see these two lights, but I'm gonna have to put up some sort of clothing rack. So using the handy rake, the rake comes in use quite often here. Ta-da! <laughs> 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 It's not unheard of for foreigners to come here, um, but certainly in the winter it's the quiet season, so there's less. Um, but despite that, the Chinese people, they always at least stare, if not talk with each other. And so I always shock all the locals uh, and the tourists as well, because I, I go on runs here, so there's, there's a road connecting all, all the, the, the palaces. And so I'll just be running on the road and literally the buses of tourists come fast. They'll, they'll literally have their hands on the windows and their faces looking out at me. So because the buses aren't running, all the tourists are having to walk all the way down the mountain. So from the top, it's about 25 kilometers. So it's quite a long walk. <laughs> I think, you know, the language barrier is still I mean, it's still there, and even though, like, more definitely, like, more and more Chinese people can speak English. Uh, but even like uh, when I used to go to Fudan, it's a big Chinese university, and a lot of these, a lot of Chinese students, they would speak English, but they're just not comfortable enough to speak, especially with a foreigner. They have this perception that foreigners speak English so much better than them, and they don't even want to try, you know. So I think that's like a, there is this kind of like a, you know division like Chinese students they hang out with themselves and then foreigners just hang out with themselves. And when I used to go to Fudan I know that Chinese students who stayed at the dorm could not come home like later than like 11 p.m. or like something like this ridiculous and we could go out we could go and come back whenever we wanted to. It kind of it feels weird that you're there are different rules for you and different rules for the locals you know. Three full days of like apartment hunting, we found a flat. So in general, they don't really have any issues with renting to foreigners. I would say, I think most of the time Chinese people are like quite friendly to foreigners. You know, they're like I know, excited to see you. The only issue is that you have to, or you most of the time you use agencies like real estate agencies in China to find an apartment, and they obviously don't speak English. But still, like what we would do, we would just communicate through WeChat. So you know, WeChat is like Chinese WhatsApp, and WeChat you can translate it right away. So you literally like stand in the agency, and you're talking to someone who's like sitting at the other side of the desk, but you're like you're not talking, you're just like WeChatting each other. There is the social network called WeChat, um, which is the equivalent of Facebook in in Western countries. Pretty much everyone has it, including all the old people, and it's it's used for payments as well. So it's kind of an all-in-one social network and wallet. And Chinese and the Taoist community here have these quite large WeChat groups. So there's something like 300 people in each group, and it, they form their own sort of social community on WeChat. So Shifu tells me three times a month he has a WeChat group, and it's an entertainment night. So everyone records them singing or playing an instrument, and then they share it on WeChat. So look, this is the feed with everyone on. So. Everyone shares their own little audio messages. And yes, I gave it a shot as well. I'm bound away, cross the wide Missouri. I have this feeling that Chinese people are more and more curious about their own culture and they have this like will to go back to their roots and you know, do things that, that used to be done. The family and the ancestry, they play a very important role in the life here. So they have um, a little shrine for the ancestors. So sometimes when we eat fruit, for example, or 
eat cakes. We have to take a little bit of the cake or we have to take a fruit and put it for the ancestors. Um, we also put one from Mao and then we have one like Buddhist shrine as well. So like three different little shrines. We put fruits and cake for all of them. They have different holidays where they go and you know burn paper money and they give offerings to the ancestors. So I've been part of that. like area my, even my street street is like I always say that it's like a little universe you know you can get everything on this street like literally everything um so that's a cool thing even though I'm I think I'm like 10 kilometers from downtown it's still considered it's not the center but it's still pretty central when you look at Shanghai because it's so huge you can get everything here and the veggies actually look so nice you can also drive your motorbike here in case you're wondering no problem and like Chinese candies or I don't know like not candies like sweets this I love it's called rice cake in English which is like the weirdest name ever because it's not sweet more veggies having your bike in here is also not a problem nothing is a problem really I think that's tofu stand that's so cool it's definitely the food that I like the most like I talk about that all the time, but it, it's just, um, I love the fact that I know where it comes from, that it's made, you know, we make all the noodles by hand and uh, all the vegetables, like in the summer when you just go out in the garden and pick vegetables and then just make food from that. And that's my favorite part in daily life. Even though I'm a vegetarian, I do like that in China they eat all of it, all of the animal. They eat like, you know, the feet and they eat the head and the brain and the, all kind of body parts that we don't eat in Europe. So I do kind of like that they don't waste uh, meat, they don't waste animal. Weather is still not great today. It's uh, it's raining a bit and it's cloudy. Although that kind of sky is pretty normal in Shanghai, also because of pollution, it's often just like white. It's not even cloudy. It's like white. Today we're gonna talk pollution. So I think China just tends to get a lot of media coverage about the pollution issue. And many people don't even know that like, for example, in Europe, we have a lot of issues with air quality as well. Pollution is like weather. It changes every day. One day you can wake up and the air quality can be amazing. Another day you wake up and the air quality is not so amazing. I would say that Chinese people are more aware of pollution than at least us in Europe. This is a responsible foreigner. This is a not responsible foreigner. Oh, oh what? <laughs> I'm oh, just joking. I'm just joking. Okay. Actually, it's not polluted today, even though it looks like it's polluted. It's just clouds. Whenever the pollution goes up, you see so many people wearing masks, and people are also aware that you're not only supposed to wear like a paper mask, you have to wear like this special mask with filters. And I know they're getting like, it's a huge discussion in China, and they talk about it a lot. My first impression was that China was quite a cut-off place and quite backwards. The government is very restrictive, it's um, freedom of speech, the whole Great Firewall, oh no, not the Great, is it, yeah, the Great Firewall of China, so the idea that their internet is very much restricted, but that couldn't be further from the truth. It is actually quite open here and very rapidly developing and changing. I'm accessing all of these websites through a VPN, which I have to pay for, and then it makes it slower, so even though I can use it, um, everything goes a little slower. So it's always a relief when I come to Sweden that everything is just so smooth, like I haven't to do anything. But I'm very glad that there is a VPN. It's not expensive, it's not hard, it's not super legal, I guess. So I don't think at the end of the day, the firewall is actually affecting as much as some people might think it is. I think a country is much more than its politics as well. So like I'm trying to explore China as 
people working for the environment. What I'm interested in is in like, you know, handicrafts and rural and traditional things. And for me, that's much more interesting than politics. And I think it's good for other people as well to see countries as more than just politics and not just focus on that. Um, because there are just people here too. People in the West still have all these predictions about China that are like China 10 years ago. And it's not, and even if it was China like literally five years ago, this country changes so fast. That's something that happened like, you know, a couple of years ago is already gone by now. Yes. Living in China exceeds all preconceptions about what you think China is, and it will please and surprise you for the whole time that you're here. Living in China is always interesting. Living in China has like widened my horizons. It has opened my mind for a lot of new ways of thinking and for new ways of living.